Radhika, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with us today. I know I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about you and the incredible work that you're doing. Um, so maybe I can just jump right in with the first question, which is, Radhika, can you share a little bit about how you first became involved in climate work, your journey, and maybe something we wouldn't otherwise know about you from your CV or bio? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here, Shar. Um, so I think the roots actually go back to my undergraduate degree in physics, uh, which at that point were, you know, it was really about the science of the world. Why do things happen the way they do? Um, but then also this weird sort of situation I was in where I was studying in Oxford, but I'd grown up in India. And so I would keep going back and forth between these two places that were so different because Oxford was so beautiful and pristine and India is beautiful too, eh? but, but you know, in a very sort of different stage of development. And, and frankly, it just made no sense in my head. Like the, the, the dissonance between these two worlds was so large. And I was stuck doing physics, which I loved, but it was also um, a way in which, you know, I, I wanted to find a relationship between my discipline um, and this disconnect between uh, two very different types of ways of living. Um, and I, I kind of got into understanding the physical sciences more. I started working on understanding the science of the environment um, and worked on atmospheric physics. And, um, you know, that's really where my, these, these three things sort of came together, where I was able to work on something that helped me make sense of how you can um, live in very different types of universes, but also build towards having a, a, a kind of a better world in some sense. Um, and, and, and it was really sort of that, um, that, that, you know, that, that early um, cognitive dissonance for me, I think, that, that brought about the environment as an avenue in which to explore this tension. Wow, super interesting. And I just, I love the framing that you experienced from a very human perspective, you know, these experiencing these contrasts, being able to call it out the, the dissonance and then using that almost as fuel for this pursuit, it sounds like you have of these, the interconnectivity and how we find ways of, of yeah, building bridges in, in areas where those bridges might not currently exist. Like super interesting. Um, this sounds like some pretty um, heavy duty, intense and very thoughtful work that you're doing. I wonder where do you go for your inspiration um, or where do you go to find sources of energy as you do this sort of really quite, as I say, intense and, and quite um, uh, thoughtful work? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit predictable, but actually just out in nature. Um, you know, in Oxford, I go to Port Meadow. <laughs> and, um, and, and the one thing about sort of being out in the open is that whatever you're experiencing, you know, good, bad, um, ugly, stressful, I always find that it's it's bigger than what you're experiencing. Like the outdoors and the natural world is actually able to contain um, what you know, whatever it is that you're walking through. So that's where I go. Wow, super cool. I remember when I was studying art, we we would learn about some of the painters that were inspired by the sublime of nature, and and it is this idea of like the things that are so much bigger than we can understand, and that we're part of it. Um, but actually experiencing that bigger, that bigness and, and, you know, feeling it in nature. Um, well, listen, I'd love to change tracks a little bit and hear a little bit more about this sort of work that you're doing in pursuit of this intersectionality. Um, I wonder if you share a little bit about what are the big research questions that you're exploring right now? Yeah. So I think the, the, my, my overarching question that has guided all my work and probably will for a long time is how do um, how do we manage the tension between providing energy for development and quality of life while protecting the environment? Um, and, and, and really, you know, how do we transition from um, growing into, into spaces, into economies, into societies that have the best quality of life, but are doing that without destroying the environment? It's interesting because I feel like there's more and more conversations that are coming up about, you know, phrases like ESG and recognizing it's not about one or the other, like we need an S together and G together, all these things are connected. Um, well, let me ask you a quick follow up question because I understand sort of some of the work that you're doing in pursuit of that big question is um, around looking at sort of the leadership practices of, um, you know, understanding what are the scopes for what we can do and how we can act now. 
um, and what is some of the innovation that's already ready to be deployed and to be invested in. And I wonder if you could share just a few headlines or highlights of what you've been uncovering in your journey on that question. Yeah, so my, my work right now is quite focused on cooling. Um, and, uh, you know, I think cooling is great. It's, it's a super challenge, global challenge, but it's also very interesting because it's tied to each of the different sustainable development goals. Um, and I think, you know, we're technologically looking at different types of options and alternatives for better cooling um, technologies, but, but, the, but the real challenge is how does one deploy that and embed that within society? Um, so I think one of the places that I'm watching quite closely is what are these big cooling technologies, what are the big cooling companies, and what are the sort of, you know, can we even shift away from the, the traditional vapor compressor air conditioner? Um, so, so sort of companies that do that and, um, you know, folks that work on that is where I'm Cool. Well, you've already, cool. I realize I'm making like the joke. Cool. Cool. Cooling is cool. Um, I, I, you've already sort of started to touch a little bit on the applications for business, which is kind of one of the themes we're interested in exploring in these kinds of conversations with Oxford at Zero Rockstars. I wondered if you could sort of riff a little bit more on it and, and maybe from the perspective, if you could choose one company or one industry to work with in terms of applying your research, which ones would it be and why? Yeah, I mean, you know, I won't take a name, um, but, I, but, but, you know, I am interested in the cooling industry. I think, I think that's really, um, that is up there. Um, but I'm also interested in the, the companies that are integrated with our everyday lifestyles. You know, like, I, really, like, what are the things that we do every single day um, that um, are, actually serviced by so much energy consumption and so much fossil fuel use at, um, and what are the ways in which they translate that into household decisions right um, so i think all the across food across mobility across like residential energy use under which cooling sits um, those are the types of companies that i'm really interested in in knowing more about working with yeah, well, and it's interesting. That's another level of intersectionality, isn't it, between like businesses and people, as you know, consumers and users and citizens, um, and and sort of really key stakeholders in all of this. So I, I really do feel there's this thread around intersectionality and, and bridging. Um, yeah. In a lot of your work here. Um, so if we were to look forward to 2030, um, I'm curious where you see things going next with the work that you're doing, and what you feel like 2030 could look like. Well, I can tell you what I want it to look like. Um, and, you know, I would really want a fully electrified world. Um, so one where we're not, you know, not using other forms of energy um, and using electricity that is clean. Um, and, I, and I think in some sense, decarbonization requires that, you know, we have to get away from, um, from, from gas, from all kinds of other ways in which we're still tapping into fossil fuels but actually move to full electrification that is supplied by, you know, by clean sources. So that's what I'd like to see. Well, that's a, a 2030 I can certainly get behind. Um, in the spirit of thinking forward to the future, we're imagining quite a few of the people that will be listening to these wonderful <laughs> conversations are gonna be young people that perhaps are coming to Oxford for the first time or have been there for a few years. What sort of advice would you give to some of the young people at Oxford or in beyond Oxford? Um, who are listening to this conversation? What should they be thinking about exploring, uh, reviewing, playing with? What advice would you give them? I actually think that that generation is doing a great job already. I think they're doing a much better job than the generation before them have. They're so committed and um, you know thinking about their everyday habits in terms of what they eat, how they move around. So I would say continue doing that and continue putting pressure upstream. Um, uh, I, I think they have a, a huge voice and, um, you know, it's okay to demand from the generations above you to do things differently. So I would push for that. What a great sort of uh, invitation to that next generation, that current generation, let's be clear in many ways, uh, but to hold, hold to account, speak truth to power. Uh, I think that's really great advice. So thank you, Radhika. La last question, and it's kind of a fun one. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, we're kind of calling this series uh, Oxford Net Zero Rockstars. And as part of that, we're interested in sort of understanding what's the kind of music that rock stars rock and roll to. So is there any sort of favorite songs or genres that you find you've been listening to recently? Um, yeah, I, I, I need to be listening to a lot more. But yesterday when I was walking, you know, I, 
was listening to Paco Bell's major in D and it's just, it's just so beautiful. So it's, you know, it's not so rock and roll, but it's timeless. Oh, I love that. I can actually imagine you going into the nature where you sort of find your energy and your inspiration and having that playing in the background. Um, I think I am going to make a note to do that this weekend, to go and find a place to have a walk. And I will put that on my Spotify playlist. Um, Radhika, thank you so much for the time and for the great conversation. Really appreciate it. And what I would say is anyone who's interested in more about Radhika's work and how it connects to Oxford Net Zero, please definitely check out her formal profile on the website, but also definitely follow her work. It's really exciting stuff. Radhika, thank you. Thank you.